Hi, my name is Noah. I'm one of the TAs for this decal. Um, yeah, and now I'm Jason. I'm also a TA. And we're filling in for your regular instructors today because they're actually at an Ethereum hackathon in Denver. So if you continue on this path, you'll be able to do cool stuff like that. So to start off, oh, go back to the, okay, cool. So yeah, everybody make sure they sign in. Hungry, hungry hippos. Again, very important for this lecture. Okay, it's not that important, but you know, it's fun at least. Uh, does everybody have the uh, sign-in URL? Okay, cool. We're going to move on. So, today's lecture is Bitcoin IRL, wallets, mining, and more. And the important things to take away from this lecture is that there's differences between normal people who just want to own and transfer Bitcoin and then people that are mining Bitcoin, the miners. And it also uh, will go in depth on how a normal user will interface with the Bitcoin network. Here's a little overview. As you can see, we're going to start off first with wallet types, then we're going to move on to wallet mechanics. Both of those sections I'll cover. And then Jason will cover mining and real world mining. And then I will come back at the end for uh, changing Bitcoin. So the first section, I'm actually going to figure out how to put this mic on myself because it's kind of aggravating to hold. So <laughs> give me one moment. Now I understand why professors always struggle with this at the beginning of classes. The first section, can everybody hear me? Does that work? Cool. Is on wallet types. And before we jump into that, um, I'm just going to do a basic review on ECDSA um, and essentially how you can get a public key from a private key. I'm not going to go too much into the actual mechanics of how ECDSA works because that's not important for this lecture. The key takeaway here is that uh, when you have a private key and you put it through the ECDSA algorithm, you get a public key. So as illustrated here, you can just kind of black box it away. Don't worry about what ECDSA does. You put in a private key, you get a public key. And the important thing about this public key that you get from the private key is that it's computationally very difficult to get that private key again after you, you know, calculated the public key. If somebody looks at your public key, they're not going to be able to say, oh, I can figure out what his private key is. It's just not possible uh, with today's technology. That should be the asterisk on a lot of these statements. Um, and then after you get this public key, um, it's hashed with uh, SHA-256 and then write MD160 to give you your Bitcoin address. Uh, and it's important to note that the uh, size of, or the set of uh, possible private keys is so large that you can expect that if you use something as a private key and it's sufficiently random, probably nobody else has ever used it before. And the uh, resulting wallet that you have will be cryptographically safe. You won't expect that anybody else will happen upon it or be able to figure it out. So just as a little review of um, the way that Bitcoin uh, addresses are represented, um, there's a little bit of issue in that certain characters look the same. So if you look up there, if I were to have an O, a zero, a capital L, and an I all together, it might be, excuse me, not a capital L, an L and a capital I together, it might be difficult to distinguish them. You've all seen license plates where somebody has like O1, 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 or O0, O0, zero, o zero, something like that. It's difficult to distinguish those characters naturally. So what we do in Bitcoin is we actually get rid of those characters. They're just not included. And what this does is it makes it so it's difficult for somebody to maybe create a visually identical address to somebody else. Because that would create issues. Because you know there's humans out there that will make that mistake and accidentally send Bitcoin to one person as opposed to another. Does that make sense? Cool. So moving on, uh, are there any questions about the last two topics? The ECDSA black box that we're going to use for this lecture, or uh, why we take away those certain characters and represent Bitcoin wallets the way we do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so doesn't it make that make it easier if technology were to be found uh, or developed to actually trace the public feedback to a private key? Uh, it, 
probably does to some scale because like you said, you're limiting the space of characters that you can use to represent those keys. But also, it's to such a negligible amount considering that, you know, uh, using the scheme we do, there's two to the 256 uh, possible, you know, hashes from SHA-256. Like, that's an insanely large number and limiting it a little bit with taking away those characters won't uh, affect the system too much. Any other questions? Cool, moving on. So we're gonna jump into wallets. So as you uh, probably noticed before, everything in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem requires your private key. Your private key is basically your identity. And your private key is really just a series of numbers. It's pretty difficult to memorize that series of numbers. It's honestly kind of tedious if you were to just, you know, write it down somewhere or try and type it up every time you need to use it. That's why we've invented uh, specialized software to manage your private key. And that specialized software is specific to you know making transactions, viewing your balance. This is what a wallet is. And it makes it so you don't have to memorize those long strings of numbers or find some way to store them on your own. There's software that'll take care of it for you. And uh, the important thing to remember when we're looking at these wallets going forward is the different types um, will present ownership of these uh, ID, these uh, private keys rather in different ways. And that's really important in this ecosystem because everything requires your private key. It's your identity. So if you don't totally own it, that might you know raise issue with some people. So just consider that going forward as we talk about some of these different wallets. So like I said before, fundamentally, uh, a wallet is a way of managing your private keys, and it allows you to interact with the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, some wallets will allow you to actually see what your private key is to maybe change it out, and other wallets actually are uh, stored in a different way. They're stored in the cloud, or they're totally inaccessible to you, so you don't actually have that ownership of your private key. And the two important types of wallets are hot wallets and cold wallets. A hot wallet is a wallet that is connected in any way, shape, or form to the internet. So that means uh, if you have an app on your phone, maybe, or if you're using uh, an exchange website, um, that's, these are all types of hot wallets. Even if you're using um, like the command line client for Bitcoin on your computer, since you're still connecting to the internet, that's a, a hot wallet. Uh, the difference here is that it's uh, easier to use typically than a cold wallet. A cold wallet is not connected to the internet at all. And these come in various forms. There's hardware wallets, which are actually pieces of technology that you plug into your computer. Um, there's brain wallets, where you actually store a mnemonic for your private key in your brain. And then there's paper wallets, where you write down your private key on a piece of paper. And the important distinction here is this is a trade-off between security and ease of use. Inherently, a cold wallet is going to be more secure than a hot wallet because say you're browsing some website that you like and that website's compromised and then you get a virus on your computer, the virus has a keylogger or it can look through your files and it compromises your private key. Your identity's just been stolen, all your Bitcoin is gone and there's nothing you can do about it. Everything is immutable on the blockchain. There's nobody you can call up and say, hey wait, this is fraud, this wasn't me. Because you've lost your private key, you've lost your identity in this ecosystem. And the difference is if you have a cold wallet where your private key is never actually connected to something that's connected to the internet, that means that there's never that opportunity for a virus or um, a website that you're browsing on or anything like that to potentially inject something that may take your key. Does that distinction make sense? Okay, cool. So um, there are some examples of the different types of wallets up there. Uh, I believe these are all uh, Bitcoin specific, though some of them have uh, support for other uh, cryptocurrencies. Like I know, for instance, the Ledger wallet, which is a hardware wallet, um, has support for a bunch of different cryptocurrencies. But uh, I'd actually like to talk a little bit more about those hardware wallets and how they work. Uh, even though you're plugging them into your computer and your computer might be connected to the internet, those hardware wallets are never directly connected to the internet. The way they work is you will create transactions that you want to be verified by your private key. And since this hardware wallet stores your private key, it can sign off on those transactions. 
but it's not connected to the internet. You send the transactions to the hardware wallet. The hardware wallet signs them. You actually, I believe, have a um, way of confirming it uh, physically with the hardware wallet, and then it sends it back to your computer, and then your computer can broadcast it to the Bitcoin network. And in that way, it's never connected directly to the internet. It's got security precautions so that it won't be compromised by malware or anything like that. And it's, in essence, a way you can keep your private key offline, but still have a little bit more ease of use. And those are actually very popular in the space right now. If you look at any of the websites for hardware wallets, you probably won't be able to buy one for at least a few months. They're all backlogged. Are there any questions on this stuff? Oh, okay. So a brain wallet is actually a very interesting topic, and I believe the next slide is all about it. So the way that a brain wallet works is you take a series of words or characters or numbers, anything that you can easily remember, and then you take the SHA-256 hash of it, and you use that as your private key. Now, there are some issues with this in that uh, humans are fallible. You know, we've got bad memory. You have to remember the exact set of words that you used you also have to remember the ordering of those words. In fact, if you were to just forget the ordering and you used 12 words, there would be 479 million different combinations of those words that it could potentially be, 12 factorial. So it's difficult in that you, it's, the impetus is totally on you. You've got to memorize those words. Um, and yeah, after you've hashed it, you can use it as a private key. But another issue is also Another way people are fallible is they think that they're random, but they're not actually random. So for instance, you might think, oh wait, I really like this song. I'll never forget the lyrics to it. I'm going to use that as my private key. And there's probably a million other people that have thought the same thing, or at least one crafty person that's been working to exploit wallets that might think, okay, well, people like songs. Maybe they're going to use song lyrics. And so this creates an issue. Humans are going to make uh, potentially insecure mnemonics for their private key. Is there a way that we can make them more secure? And that brings me to key stretching. The idea behind key stretching is that if you take any phrase or any mnemonic that you've come up with and you run it through the SHA-256 algorithm once, that's probably not going to be super uh, secure because, like I said, people are not random. But what happens if you just keep doing it again? You keep running it through the algorithm. That's a way that you can add security on top of these mnemonics. Say I come up with something that's you know, not really random at all. If any of you are fans of XKCD, what if my mnemonic is correct horse battle stapler? And I run it through SHA-256 10 to the 20 times. Now anybody that's trying to use that really popular phrase to maybe find a Bitcoin wallet, or excuse me, uh, yeah, a Bitcoin wallet that was created with it, a private key that was created with it, they'll have to know how many times I hashed it as well. Because the space of uh, hashes in the SHA-256 system is so large, every intermediary hash is also probably unique in that 10 to the 20 hashes as well. So by running it through SHA so many times, I've actually kind of bootstrapped more security. Does that make sense? And did I answer your question as well? Are there any other questions about brain wallets? Yes? Aren't there a lot of different functions except for like just memorizing the password for like a hot wallet. So how does the uh, brain wallet control all of those other functions? Like you said, the hot wallet, one of the functions of the wallet is to trace every transaction. So how does the brain wallet do that function? So a brain wallet is actually a cold wallet. So it won't have as many integrated features as a hot wallet. But say if you're using Electrum, which is one of the Bitcoin hot wallets, it connects to the web. You can actually see the history of all the transactions that you've made, or you can you know, see your public address and your Bitcoin address or your private key. You can see all of those things uh, pretty easily in a user-friendly way. A brain wallet is less about those user-friendly features. It's more about the security of never having that private key or the mnemonic for the private key written down anywhere or on any system. It's like the ultimate form of security if you can pull it off correctly. Any other questions? Cool. Moving forward. So when it comes to wallets, there's uh, trade-offs. And the trade-offs are typically between security and ease of use, as I've alluded to before. If you look on the left, uh, people typically want features in their wallets. 
Um, and some of those features actually can be increases in security as well, but they make it maybe a little bit more difficult to use. One uh, key feature that's actually really important in the Bitcoin system that was the result of pay to script hash, which we talked about last week, uh, is multi-signature wallets. So this is a wallet that will require multiple people to sign off with their private key um, on a transaction before it can actually go through. And there are certain wallets that will actually help take care of this for you, make it easier to do. And say, for instance, you had um, the CEO of a company and his chief financial officer and then a third high-ranking executive, they all, or at least two of them needed to sign off on something before it happened. That would be a good use case for a multi-signature wallet. They all have private keys. If two of the three don't want something to happen, they don't have to let it happen, but they can't be vetoed. They can't have their funds restricted. Um, yeah. So uh, that's one of the important features. Um, additionally, there's privacy um, features that actually make it more difficult to track your Bitcoin usage. One is Tor integration. If you haven't heard of it, Tor is the Onion router. Um, it works through people hosting nodes that anonymize your traffic because your traffic is going through so many different people that uh, it's very difficult to trace it back to you. And there's additional anon anonymizing features that are built on top of it. And then the last feature is um, creating new addresses for each transaction. These all increase your privacy in that it makes it more difficult for people to track your usage. Further on the right, there's security um, uh, features that are added as well. Uh, so one of the different ways you can transact on the Bitcoin network is actually downloading um, a, a client that interacts, uh, or excuse me, a client that has the full blockchain history. And this makes it so that you don't have to actually trust other miners maybe to verify transactions. But you can also run um, a wallet that interacts with a third party and that third party will actually be the one to broadcast your transactions after you've created them. Uh, in the first case, it can be difficult in the sense that it'll take up a lot of space, but there's actually been some developments on that in the form of thin clients, which we'll get to later. Um, further on, uh, in different wallet ecosystems, different people hold onto the keys or manage the keys. So for instance, if you're using like Electrum, that actually keeps all the private keys for your Bitcoin wallets local. It never goes to a third party. It's totally on your own system. But if you're using something like Coinbase, it's interesting because you actually don't have a private key that you can access. The Coinbase uh, organization, the corporation, runs hot wallets and they're the ones that are doing all the transactions and you can't actually access any of those wallets. You can't say like, I want my private key because they won't give it to you because that's not how they operate. You just have an account with them and you've got a certain balance and they track that balance, but they're not actually assigning you a private key or anything like that. There's pros and cons of this. Uh, one of the cons that a lot of people in the Bitcoin space will bring up is that this is centralization. This is you trusting a third party to not be compromised. And it's you putting this organization kind of into a power position. And that's, you know, against the goals of decentralizing uh, the financial system or something along those lines because you've essentially taken something that was supposed to be decentralized and kind of made it a little bit more centralized. But also, that said, it is much easier to use than setting up your own wallet or you know, going through the process of generating a private key. And even with all-inclusive wallets, uh, like ones that will generate private keys for you, it's still ease of mind in the sense that Coinbase is somebody that you can hold accountable if you have issues. So there's trade-offs, like I said. Are there any questions on any, any of that content? Cool. Moving forward. Questions? <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about how you can store Bitcoin, um, how you can create a wallet, and now we should actually talk about how you can get it. Because right now it just seems like magic internet money, you know? Like, how do people actually acquire Bitcoin? So one way that you can acquire Bitcoin in person, actually, is you can go to a Bitcoin ATM. And there's actually one really close by. Uh, it's on 1250 University Avenue. And you could literally just go up to it. If you already have a Bitcoin wallet, uh, if you have an application that will put the wallet's address into a QR form, it'll literally just scan that QR code. You put in cash or pay with debit, or credit, or whatever. Press send, and then you'll have Bitcoin. Isn't that pretty crazy? 
And there's actually more ne since this uh, picture was made. There's a bunch of Bitcoin ATMs all over Berkeley. So you could go to one and you could buy yourself some Bitcoin. So maybe you should try that after class, but don't buy too much because it's kind of volatile right now. Maybe wait, let it <laughs> settle. Or, you know, if you want to risk it, go for it. So moving on, uh, there's also online exchanges. And exchanges uh, will typically allow you to transact different currency or different uh, cryptocurrency for other cryptocurrency or other fiat currency. And it's important because they essentially can set the market price. They're not the only ones that do it because you notice know, supply and demand, but they're one of the most uh, visible systems where people are trading for a certain price. Uh, further on, they're typically easy to use. They're easy to access. If you go to coinbase.com, it was actually the way I got into it at first. Uh, it's really easy to set up. You just connect a bank account or a credit card or a debit card, and then you can just start buying Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash, but don't buy Bitcoin Cash. People don't like Bitcoin Cash. Uh, but moving on, uh, the one of the issues that we mentioned before is that these are centralized institutions, and that could pose a risk because, say, Coinbase is hacked or there's some sort of uh, insider plot. Uh, we've seen situations like this where lots of money has disappeared from exchanges. For instance, with Mt. Gox, which filed bank, which was hacked and then filed bankruptcy, and I believe not even just millions, but billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin disappeared, and nobody ever was reimbursed. That was approximately 120,000 Bitcoins were stolen. So, I mean, that's one of the issues with these centralized exchanges. There's a centralized point of failure, too, which makes it a lot more tantalizing for malicious actors to try and uh, exploit it somehow. That said, uh, it's typically considered not safe to keep your money in exchanges for long terms. So typically, the rationale is to move it to a different type of wallet that's more secure. Moving on, uh, there's centralized exchanges. So there should also be decentralized exchanges, because that's the idea that Bitcoin is founded on decentralization. If we can decentralize the currency, why can't we decentralize the exchanges? They don't rely on a third party service to hold the customer funds or do any of the mission critical work. Uh, it's basically all on you. The trades are peer to peer, but they're more, uh, they're facilitated essentially by these decentralized exchanges. Uh, this is done by creating proxy tokens or assets that represent a certain amount of fiat or cryptocurrency. And I'm sure you've seen that image a lot. I don't need to go through it again. But the idea is a centralized exchange. It's got those centralized points of failure, but it's usually easier to use. A decentralized exchange, it's all on you. You're the point of failure. So if you make a mistake, you could lose your money. There's nobody to hold accountable. But you also don't have to worry about somebody else making a mistake and losing your money. So it's really a trade-off. Uh, some examples of these decentralized exchanges, there's BitSquare, BitShares, Open Ledger, uh, NXT, Counterparty, I think there's one called BISC. Um, they're not necessarily better than centralized exchanges, they're just different. There's a different set of security considerations and you know there's trade-offs between any two of uh, these two systems rather. Yes? So should decentralized exchange be uh, You can't really hack a decentralized exchange because it's all peer-to-peer. -peer. You can hack individual users, but you can hack the exchange, so far as I know. Um, I can actually follow up with that on uh, Piazza, but I, I don't believe that like you can actually hack the system. I read somewhere on Twitter or something that that hacked like twice or something. I haven't heard about that, but I'll look into that and I'll get back to you. Uh, you know, it's like websites. Like, oh, okay. some, someone else is up there with that thing. And then it leaked it or something. Um, it was good for that one. Mm. Okay, so that makes sense. So yeah, it's, it's very difficult to hack decentralized systems because they do depend on a bunch of different parties and you kind of have to like compromise a lot of them to actually do something. And even then, uh, Bitcoin transactions are still verified in the same way. So there's that additional layer. Yeah. Would you recommend these over Binance? Well, Binance is still a centralized exchange, isn't it? It's hard to recommend one over the other. It's all about your security concerns and basically your trust in systems. Yeah, if you'd like to talk more after class.
Any other questions? Yes. Uh, probably some central corporation, centralized corporation that's seen as profitable to uh, disperse Bitcoin like that. But the Bitcoin itself will be sent to whatever address you gave it. So it's not like it's being held by that company after you buy it. Yes. I have no idea. I've never actually gone to a Bitcoin ATM. Does anybody know if you need ID to buy from one? I know there's no your customer laws. I feel like if you were to go to a Bitcoin ATM and try and spend like $10,000 to buy Bitcoin, it might set off some red flags somewhere, but I couldn't neither like confirm or deny that, you know, that exists. Okay, we're going to move on. So that was actually the questions time. I keep doing that. Oh yeah, JC. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so long as it's on the exchange itself, it's not actually owned by you. You don't have access to that private key. You just have that account. But as soon as you actually send it somewhere else that you do have the private key for, that's yours. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right, moving on. So next we're going to go into wallet mechanics. This is how uh, different wallets work. So in previous lectures, we learned that Bitcoin miners have to actually download the entire blockchain so that they can validate transactions. Normal users don't have to do this. It would be an undue burden. It would make it really difficult for the average user to actually you know, you know, interact with the system. What they do is they use a system called simple payment verification. And like clients that connect to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, what they do is they get relevant information to whatever transactions they're making, and they can verify it using proof of inclusion with the Merkle root and the Merkle branches for a specific block header. So the idea is they don't need to have the entire blockchain, they just need to look at things that are relevant to them. So say somebody is trying to send them a certain amount of Bitcoin for something, they just want to verify that that person actually has that money. They don't have to look at you know, the entire space of like all transactions ever, they just have to look at wherever that transaction is originating from. They can see that, uh, you know, it's it's been the the UTXO that they're drawing on has been included in a, another block previously. That they're not just inventing it out of thin air. Does that concept make sense? And going further on that, uh, if you look, there's a little diagram of the Merkle tree. And if you recall, the way a Merkle tree is set up, you don't actually have to look through every single branch of it. You just have to look at hashes at specific points and make sure that the end result of hashing different things together is the same. So uh, in previous lectures when we learned about that, in the technical lecture rather, uh, it's just a way to show that there's a transaction that was actually included in a block. Are there any questions about simple payment verification? How do people feel about it? Thumbs up if you feel like you get it. Sideways if you're still a little bit, if you're down, if you have no idea. So it seems like a lot of people are still pretty iffy. Okay, so the idea uh, is, well, bringing it back to the motivation, the idea is that you don't want to have everybody have to download the entire blockchain because it's huge. It's over 100 gigabytes. It might even be over 200 gigabytes at this point. I haven't checked in a while. So that's just a crazy amount of stuff to download. But if instead, when you're trying to make transactions, you selectively download just the specific transactions you need to verify the transaction that is being made, you don't have to have the entire thing. You just have to have those select transactions. So you can speak to, you can basically pull from uh, different miners in the system and make sure that a certain transaction has been included in a past block. Does that explanation make it like a little bit more clear or how are we feeling? Thumb scale. Okay. 
still seems a little bit iffy, but we can uh, clarify a little bit more in discussion. Another aspect of wallets is the idea of a multi-signature wallet. Like I said previously, this was a result of pay to script hash, uh, which we discussed last week. Um, the idea is if you have a certain amount of people that own a wallet and you want to make sure that no one person or no small group of people can spend that money in the wallet without a certain amount of consensus, what you can have is a multi-signature wallet. And the way that that works is, say you have five people and they've got shared funds for a project. You can make a multi-signature wallet that requires three of the five people to sign off on a transaction before it happens. And the way that'll work is, you know, say two of them decide that they want to buy something, but the other three disagree. They won't have enough signatures to actually verify and validate the transaction so that they can broadcast it. So the idea is, it's like a joint bank account almost, except I think in a joint bank account you can actually just withdraw money. But if you were to make a big like transaction in a joint bank account, there would be some check, some check to make sure that everybody knows that that's happening. It's the same idea. A multi-signature wallet is like a check to make sure that there's consensus among a group of people. Does that concept make sense? Cool. Here is a picture for how this works. For some reason, two people were cut off. I don't know why. You can see one of them on the far right up there. Imagine the two lines are also people. Uh, in this system, there is a multi-signature wallet that requires three people, at, or excuse me, two people out of three people. And there are three people in total. You can see that two people agree, as symbolized by the dotted lines going to the safe. And the third person doesn't agree, but that doesn't matter. In this system, since it's a two of three multi-signature wallet, they can make the transaction. It's broadcast to the Bitcoin network. It's validated. It's included in the block. And that transaction is made. Any questions? Cool. OK, cool. So uh, further mechanics. Um, it's best practice in the Bitcoin system to never reuse your uh, identities. And that's because every time you do, you're adding a little bit more info information about yourself. A good analog to think about is, say you're posting on a social media site like Reddit. If you just make a throwaway account every time you post, nobody's ever really going to be able to link those posts together. At least they won't be able to do it easily. But if you have one account where you're making all your posts, people will be able to make a pretty you know, good picture of who you are as a person just based on what you're posting. It's the same idea with the transactions you make. If you make a lot of transactions from one uh, Bitcoin wallet, from one private key, essentially, uh, it's easier to kind of clue in who that person is. Whereas if every single time you have a new transaction, you make a new private key, then that's a little bit more difficult, if not impossible, for somebody that's trying to maybe compromise your identity or figure out your spending habits or anything like that. It's more difficult for them to do because they're totally unrelated. And this creates kind of an issue where you've actually got a lot of private keys if you keep repeating all these identities, or if you keep repeatedly making identities, rather. So how do we manage them? And that's where, well, not questions yet. <laughs> That's where uh, different wallet backup ideas come from. So the first one is JVOK, which is just a bunch of keys. And that's a Bitcoin wallet where it literally is just generating keys as you need them. Or maybe if you want to start off and just make 50 keys, you can do that. But it's just a big list of keys. And the issue here is that every time you generate a new key, you're going to have to back up that as well. Because you know, you've got a new key that's new funds. You don't want to lose it. Um, say like you make certain transactions and the last transaction you need a new key, you create a new key and there's 10 Bitcoin there, you wouldn't want that 10 Bitcoin to not be backed up somewhere. So this just a bunch of keys method, it's kind of naive just having this list of keys. Uh, it brings us to uh, the next method that was created which is hierarchical uh, deterministic wallets. And the way that this works is a hierarchical deterministic wallet is generated from one master key. And the master key uh, is, or excuse me, master seed. And the master seed is typically like a mnemonic or something, something that uh, you can store pretty easily. And that uh, creates basically a parent key. 
and that parent key can be used to generate children keys. And those children keys can also generate children keys. But the important thing to note here is that it doesn't go back up the, the line. So a child key cannot generate its parent key. So the idea is it's hierarchical. So there's the parent, there's children that branch out, and then from those children, there's more children that branch out. And all you need to recover the children is a parent key. But the children don't go back up to the parent key. You can't actually get the parent key from the child. Does that idea make sense? There's actually a, a picture here. This one might be a little bit more didactic. You have the entropy or whatever you use, the randomness to create your master parent key. Then the parent key can generate the children key and the children can generate even more. The only thing that you have to remember is the index of whatever key you're trying to get. And then the hierarchical deterministic wallet can generate the keys, the children keys from the master key in the same way. Um, going back to this, this is actually the, uh, a brief overview of how that algorithm kind of works. So you've got the parent key, it can generate child keys. It's a one-way hash, so you can't bring it back. And the children can continue the same thing and generate more. And you might ask, what are the use cases for a wallet like this? Say you're like a CEO of a company and you have the master key and you want the people below you to have their own keys, but you don't want them to be able to access your key. You also want to know what their keys are. You don't want them to be independent of yours. You can create a hierarchical deterministic wallet and have your master key generate children keys for all the employees beneath you and then they can generate uh, children keys for all the employees beneath them. And you've got a complete log of all the keys that exist, essentially. But you don't have to worry about backing them all up. You can just back up the parent key, and it works out. Are there any questions about this, this topic? It's kind of a confusing concept. So thumbs? Well, where are you on the range? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, an exchange would utilize it um, in the basic sense. It's just an easy way to create and back up a lot of keys. So they're not necessarily using it in like the CEO company scheme. They're just using it so that they can back up that one uh, master mnemonic, master key, and then they don't really have to worry about backing up all the other keys that they generate for their uses. So say on an exchange, you don't really want to have all your Bitcoin in one wallet, right? So you'll generate this, this parent key, and then you can generate a lot of children wallets. And all you have to do is note down the index, what's called the index of those different uh, children keys. And you don't have to, like, like I said, you don't have to back them all up. You can just keep that parent one and generate them as needed. And that kind of like, it's like putting your eggs in more than one basket. Since you've got your Bitcoin spread out, if somebody compromises one key, so you've lost some Bitcoin, but you haven't lost all your Bitcoin. So that's kind of how an exchange uses them. Yeah. And they're good for personal use too because, like I said, you only have to back up the parent key. Are there any? Yes. Is this one my hardware one? Like, well, it's public key and the rest is public key? I couldn't tell you. Which uh, wallet do you use? Yeah. Are we? What is it? It's not for I'm uncertain. Uh, I'd have to know the altcoin, and yeah, I can't say offhand. Yes, so that is uh, an issue with this system. Uh, the question was, if you hack the parent key, will you also compromise all the children keys? Yes. Um, yeah, so far as I know, essentially it just goes on. Like, if you have the parent key, you've got everything. So that is an issue. So that means you'd have to take even more security measures than typical of just a private key. JC. Is that applicable to each child key in the brain as well? So if I compromise a child key, then you have to do Yes. Yeah, so the way it works is from any child, you can like uh, derive any of its descendant keys. So if you were to hack something, let's go back to the picture. If you were to hack something right there, you could get this entire chain because they're all derived from that key. Any other questions? Uh, 
I'm not 100% sure on the specifics. Um, we can bring it up in discussion or make a post on Piazza. Yeah, cool. All right, so moving forward, uh, Jason is going to take over. Oh, okay. Well, isn't the five minute break like halfway through? Okay, five minute break. We will come back in a few moments. Yeah, dude. Yeah, that actually went to the next That was good, yeah. Any recommendations? I should Yeah, I was expecting Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I'd say Yeah. I didn't know what you are doing. What's up, dude? Turn on the camera, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Noah, did you take a picture? I took pictures of you, but I have to go right now. Can you take a picture of Jason? Yeah, for sure. And I'd like to know, like, where I've had a question. Oh, it's at the end for this week. Plus. Like what it is? No, I turned it off. Um. Oh. Yeah, it's on this thing. I can do it. Do you want it on? Yeah. But we're not done yet. I mean, yeah, just on when we start. Okay. I'm just gonna. Okay, you can keep it on. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can see some of the So don't really think that's the white slides. So I think it's inherent to the script that's used. I'm not because when it's like black, like there's a lot of I can get back to that, but if I had to yeah. 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 There's also uh, a You would create a square like if you just walk away and use like whoever's public key is involved. Oh, really? That was uh, uh, yeah. wallet. So I mean, say, it's all like that. Exactly. You can say, um, allow, so, yeah. like, this is a, uh, in general, the actual program technology, but anyway, like, uh, this is a script that will only let, um, like, two of these three people spend this money. Or, like, at least two of these three. Okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that was this is your first life. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this will be for you. Oh, you're doing a good job. Like, I, we just enrolled in this class. I have a talk to them. Oh, yeah. If, yeah. Um, what you could do is, if you want to come on over. All that stuff is actually online. So if you want to catch up, um, there's, like, all the lectures and everything. Oh, there's three before this one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And... One of them was very technical, one of them was not, and then one of them was just kind of like average. And I would say like, if you spend maybe an hour or two going through each of them, like, you'd be kind of, yeah. yeah. And it's all on this website, is what I meant to say. This um, one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it's two units, right? Two units, yes. In the other on the CK website, it says one. Huh, that's weird. It's two. Yeah, it's two. Yeah, I mean, on your Cal Central, it should show as two. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, guys. We're going to start the second part of the lecture. Uh, so next up, we'll be talking about mining. My name is Jason, and I'm a TA as well. Uh, so mining, we hear this term all the time when we're talking about cryptocurrencies. But in this section, we're going to really dive into what it really means and the technicals of that. Uh, I see mining as the consensus protocol between what makes Bitcoin powerful, or not Bitcoin, just cryptocurrencies in general. Um, without a consensus protocol, when you add... Just move your mic up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> When you add information to the ledger, uh, you need to do it in a way that's secure and safe, and also a way that everyone can agree on, or else it's just a public uh, storage thing that anyone can add to, right? So first off, we're going to go into some review on mining. Uh, what exactly does mining do? So one of the main functions of mining in Bitcoin is that mining updates the blockchain. Uh, and, that, and that we mean that mining will uh, create transactions and then batch them together into blocks, and then add these blocks to the blockchain. When you hear mining, this is what the word mining means. In addition to that, mining also has a secondary purpose, and that means that mining will uh, create new coins in the system. When Bitcoin first started, when the first Genesis block was created, there were no coins in the system except from the first block. All the Bitcoins that we have today exist through mining. So miners serve as verifiers. If you want to be a miner in the Bitcoin network, or also known as a full node, you have to first download the entire transaction history inside Bitcoin. After that, you verify incoming transactions that you get from other nodes. So when people send transactions, you as a miner will listen, to those, listen for those transactions and prepare to receive them and add them to blocks. After that, you create a valid block from those transactions and you find a valid nonce. We'll talk more about this later in this lecture. And we just hope that, um, as a miner, that when you solve a block, you hope that no one else has solved it before you, and that your block becomes accepted by the network. After that, you are rewarded. So recall that in every block, we have a block header. This was in the last lecture, I think. And that has a hash from the previous block, a nonce, and a hash of all the transactions in that block. Um, and we call that the Merkle root. Pretty much, it verifies that all the transactions are valid, and that they're there, and haven't been tampered with. So the problem in proof of work, essentially, is uh, trying to calculate a value lower than a target that we provide. 
So when a miner succeeds in finding the next block, what they do is they find the hash of the block header that they create, and they find a nonce that goes with that um, block header that hashes to a value that's lower than a certain value. So essentially, the miner is guessing and repeatedly hashing possible values to find a value that's lower at a certain range. Um, it helps to think of mining as a sort of global competition. Um, have you guys played the game Hungry Hungry Hippos before? Yeah? Uh, if not, Hungry Hungry Hippos is a game in which um, players are trying to repeatedly mash a sort of toy hippo that's in front of them so they can eat as many balls as possible. It's entirely random. The hippo just eats what's, it, what's in front of it. Um, but in this uh, metaphor, let's, let's pretend that each hippo has a specific ball that they're trying to eat. And when they eat that ball, they win. So as a miner, you want to try to increase the times that you can guess and um, the rate at which you can kind of chomp in this metaphor. Right? Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, we'll talk more about this later, but the rationale is that um, you kind of don't know who's going to be the next person adding to the blockchain. If there's one person who's in charge of adding everything to the blockchain, it's pretty much a centralized system. Right. Uh, and something else to note is that the longest chain wins. So the longest chain at the time is the accepted uh, blockchain. So if someone makes like a fake block to add to the chain, um, hopefully the rest of the network will be able to have more power than hashing power than he has, right? More computational power. So they will make the longer chain if they're all honest. Yeah. Uh, if that's it, I'll be moving on. So mining incentives. This is great and all. Mining verifies the system. It keeps everything secure. But why would someone want to participate in this network? And why would I want to mine? The answer is uh, profit. That's why they do it. Um, pretty much, if people who are uh, trying to mine, they're doing it for economic reasons. Um, that's how we incentivize people to participate in the network. And uh, yeah. so at the heart of uh, all game theory, we just try to assume that um, all the actors are trying to profit as much as possible. Uh, most people will want money, right? So we define profit as revenue minus cost. Uh, cost meaning the uh, cost of which to produce that revenue. <coughs> so inside of uh, mining in Bitcoin, our revenue com is comprised of the block reward and the transaction fees that are in that block. And first we'll talk about the block reward. Currently right now in Bitcoin, every block that comes with a reward of 12.5 Bitcoin. So if you're lucky enough to solve the, uh, the hash and get the hash that's lower than the target and add the next block to the chain, you're awarded 12.5 Bitcoins. And that's like close to, that's like $125,000 or 100, yeah, yeah. Or is that right? Yeah, 125000 so um, inside every transaction, or inside every block, the miner will uh, make, a, make a transaction and gift that 12.5 Bitcoin to themselves. And that's the first transaction in every block. Um, this incentivizes people to act honestly and uh, to not try to disrupt the network. Because if you're awarded in Bitcoin and you try to disrupt the network, um, yeah, you just lose money when Bitcoin drops. And you don't want that. Um, something else to note is that Bitcoin is a deflationary currency. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder of Bitcoin, disagreed with how banks and financial institutions could just print money at will. So there's 21 million Bitcoins fixed in the system, and the reward for solving a block halves every 210,000 blocks. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, what's up? Uh, could you repeat that? Is that 21 million? That's like your original 10 million, right? Yeah. That's yeah. Like how many lost that. Exactly, yeah. If Bitcoin is lost or you lose your hard drive to a private key, it's just lost, yeah. And next up, we'll be talking about the transaction fees. So um, as we talked about before, uh, if the block reward halves every few years, and eventually if it um, stops uh, being produced at all, at, at a certain point, and at 2140, I believe, um, in the year 2140, there will be no more Bitcoins released in the system. So the uh, miners need another reason to mine, right? And that's transaction fees. The rationale is that eventually, um, 
if Bitcoin network will be large enough that uh, miners will just, the block reward will um, be only transaction fees and that'll be enough. That'll be enough to make people want to mine. Um, transaction fees are uh, completely voluntary. When you make a transaction, you imply a transaction fee. So previously in our UTXO model, there's, for every transaction, there's an input and an output. Um, the amount that you don't include from the output, so the input minus the output, and the difference, the difference goes to you as a miner. Um, and uh, when you're a miner, you're looking for transactions that have the highest transaction fees. Because as a miner, you can choose which transactions go in the block. If you wanted to, you can make a block with zero transactions and only get the block reward. But why not pick up some money on the side and include transactions with high transaction fees? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So if you pay a high fee, you'll be prioritized first. So are there any transactions Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the transactions with zero fee just don't get processed at all. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have any transactions in your blocks, can you like calculate the root reward calculate blocks mm. So uh, I think you're talking about the Merkle root, right? Um, that's fine. I think you just hash your Coinbase transaction, like the transaction that you give to yourself. And yeah, uh, because it's still a block header, right? It's still hashable. And it's important to clarify that you can never just have no transactions as a miner. You always have that Coinbase transaction. Yeah, yeah. Like having um, a certain amount of transactions doesn't make your block invalid or valid. So yeah. Yeah. If there's any more questions, uh huh. Um, when people say that, pretty much like when the price of Bitcoin increases, the transaction fee increases as well. Also, if there's more competition, like if people want their transactions confirmed faster than others, they'll just make a higher fee, right? And that creates a sort of like market. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. How is the 21 Bitcoin limit enforced? Um, so that's just the way it's uh, processed in the system, right? So if you want to make a valid block, you're only allowed to give yourself a certain amount of Bitcoin in your Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if if you give yourself more um, in the Coinbase, it won't be accepted as valid. Yeah, <coughs> does that clear things up? Mm -hmm. um, and now moving on to the cost for mining. Um, within mining, there's fixed costs and variable costs. So that means when you first buy hardware to mine, if you've heard about that, if you've heard about people buying large rigs to mine, that's the fixed cost. That's the kind of initial investment you have to create. And in addition to that, you also have to um, provide other resources to feed your mining rig and keep it running. <coughs> so in fixed costs, uh, we're mostly talking about the processing unit that you're using to um, make all these hashes. And at the start of Bitcoin, um, all we used was CPUs, and that's just the central processing unit and general computers. And the concept was that uh, anyone with a computer can participate in the network, they can vote, and like they can mine together. But after a while, um, it became more competitive, and uh, graphics cards, or GPUs, um, became more widespread, and beca they became the main form of mining. Um, some disadvantages are that uh, they're not great for running side to side in a mining farm. Um, and they're also, uh, it's also something good to note is that they're an order of magnitude faster than a CPU. So this is significantly more competitive and the market just kept racing and racing. Um, after that, we have FGPAs. And that stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And it sort of marks a transitionary period between dedicated hardware, just for mining, and um, hardware that's like more uh, general use and that can be used for anything. If, uh, if say I have a bunch of GPUs and I'm mining Bitcoin or Ethereum, and let's say Ethereum crashes, right? Um, if it actually crashes, I can still use those graphic cards and they still have value to me. But if I buy a dedicated piece of hardware just for mining and um, the currency just crashes completely, I kind of lose out on the initial investment that I create. And that brings us to ASIC miners. Um, if you guys haven't heard of them, an ASIC is an application specified integrated circuit. And this machine or this piece of hardware is only used for mining. And most mining today on the Bitcoin network uses ASICs. It's an almost impossible to mine profitably without an ASIC. And uh, yeah, 
Um, also, there's a company in China called Bitmain, and they produce 70% of all the ASICs. And that's sort of troubling because um, that provides a huge point of centralization that one entity can have so much hashing in the network. Yeah. So if I have a GPU uh -huh. and all the other miners have an ASIC, does yeah. that logically mean that I'm not, I'm never going to win a game and I'm never going to create a, I'm never going to have a success in my trading process? Um, is there a faster than Exactly. Me? Like, uh, speaking mathematically, yeah, it's almost impossible for you to solve a block. So it might not be worth it to do it at all. And I mean, I'm not sure about for other cryptocurrencies, but just in Bitcoin. Um, I will talk about it later, but some currencies are uh, resistant to using ASICs. Yeah. Is there another question? No, I think you just answered it. Oh, cool. Awesome, awesome. Uh, moving on from fixed costs, we'll be talking about the variable costs. Running a mining rig has costs associated with it that are constant and always um, an issue. So when you mine, there's energy. Uh, first of all, if you're building the um, processing unit yourself, you have to spend energy to create that. If not, you don't need to worry about it. But there's always electricity costs and cooling, cooling costs. In addition to that, you need somewhere to store your, um, your mining rig. If you have a really big farm, you need to pay for a warehouse. Also, personnel. Um, even if you're running a rig by yourself, you still need to count in the cost of your own time. And that definitely costs something. Uh, an interesting idea recently was that um, people were making this concept called a data furnace, and that means that uh, people were thinking about heating their homes using their mining rigs. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> why would you waste all that heat that's expended from your, um, your ASIC, right? If all that heat um, you need to cool down, why not just use it to heat your own home? Uh, after that, we'll dive into the rationale of mining. Um, and like we'll talk about why it was constructed in this way. Um, here's what we do know. We know that profit is a motivator. We expect people to um, work for their own profit. Also, we want to create a system where um, people are incentivized to act honestly and not be malicious and mess with the network. So what we come down to and what we conclude with is that uh, we create a sort of system that rewards people who act honestly. And the way to do that is by making them expend energy which pretty much is money, because electricity costs money, as well as um, costs in buying hardware as a sort of investment um, in order to secure the network. And they're only paid out in Bitcoin. So in a way, they're sort of exchanging cash, like US dollars, for Bitcoin. Implicitly, kind of. And this means that they'll act honestly for the network, because if they act against it, they're owners of Bitcoin, they're holders of Bitcoin. Why would they want to lower their, their share of the... Uh, the network. Yeah, did you have a question? Uh, no? No? Okay. Yeah. Right now? Um, it's mostly done by mining pools. And I'm talking about that right now. Yeah, uh, I'll answer your question if you have more after. But yeah, and so this will be uh, mining in the real world. Oh, first we'll go over questions. Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay, okay. So we'll talk about real world mining and what mining looks like today in 2018. So right here on the picture to the left is a picture of a mining farm in China. And it's just a huge uh, warehouse with the um, ASICs line side to side and just these fans that are blasting it. Um, it's not really about aesthetics here, it's just about hashing as fast as possible. Um, on the right is another picture of a mining farm and if you see down there in the bottom right corner, that's a cooling system. Yeah, and this is what an ASIC looks like. So the ASIC is the fastest um, piece of hardware we have out there right now. Um, both of these are made by Bitmain, the company I mentioned before in China that creates 70% of all the ASICs in the world. And on the right, we have the Antminer S9, and that's the fastest, uh, yeah, that's the fastest we have. Also, when you're mining in the real world, if you're just a single lone miner, it's not really feasible for you to mine because uh, when you do win, you win in chunks. You don't win consistently, right? Um, every, maybe like every few years, you'll solve a block and you'll get a huge payout. But if you buy a large rig and um, 
invest that down payment, like say you, I spend $10,000 and buy a bunch of ASICs, I might go in debt before I get a return. So mining in the real world is usually done in mining pools. And what that means is that miners will pool their power together so that um, they get a more steady return on rewards. So they, they pool their computational power and they split the reward. But the problem with that is that you need someone to be the head of that pool and control it, essentially, because you need someone to receive the reward and split it with everyone else, right? And that's what we call a pool manager or a pool operator. And they'll take a small cut from the mining reward. And the method that we use, uh, or the most common model for mining in a mining pool is called uh, pay by share. And pretty much miners will submit shares, which are uh, blocks that are almost solved to the pool miner, or to the pool manager. And um, they are paid for every share that they set. So for the proportion of the mining power that they have, they are paid in. Of course, if I'm participating in a pool, and I do half of all the work, I should be paid for that much, right? But the thing is that when you solve a block as well, you're not um, winning more. You get a same consistent payout no matter who solves the block in your pool. It's also something, uh, you might also be asking, like, why can't I, as a participant in this pool, just run away and steal all the, uh, the reward, right? Like, I can get the, the payout from the block if I don't solve the block, but if I actually solve the block, why would I share it with my pool? That might be a question that you have. But the problem with that is that within every block, there's a transaction that, uh, with you sending your own money to yourself or to the miner. And we call that a Coinbase transaction, where you, when you solve the block, send money to yourself. It's called a Coinbase. And uh, when you're working with a pool, you use the Coinbase of the pool manager. So, and you're only paid in shares when, the, when you have a block that has a Coinbase of the pool manager as well. So that's how they get around that. In addition to pay per, pay per share, we have the system called proportional. And that pays out um, proportional to when blocks are found. Unfortunately, that model isn't used that much because uh, it's only good for the, it's not, it's good for the pool, but miners don't really want to participate in that. Uh, yeah. Um, so the two, something to note about the two, the two differences between um, the two payment methods is that one is optimal for miners and one is optimal for the pool. Because in the pay per share model, um, you are paid as a miner for every share you submit. But if your pool doesn't win that round or that block, you're still paid. So the pool has to take on the debt until um, they actually solve the block. But pay per proportional sharing, you only get paid when your pool finds it. So if your pool is also very small in the network, your rewards will also not be distributed that well. Yeah. Great question. So you download the software from the pool, and um, you're not you're not mining on the actual like um, Bitcoin mining software. Um, you're just calculating hashes on someone else's software. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said you share like near valid blocks, right? Mm -hmm. But aren't hashes like like there's no way to get caught or there's no way to get one or two a hash, right? So why are these important? Um, pretty much it's the way that we prove that they're actually calculating hashes. Like they could be lying and saying they're not. So um, when it's near valid, it means that you're very close to the target value, but you're not exactly under it. Yeah. Mm. What exactly is this? This of all the boxes that they combine to the other pool that was the same boxes. So it shares a block that's almost valid? but it's not necessarily under the target value when you hash it. Could you rephrase the question? Is this share like a list of blocks that the miner is already derived to all every block of doing just the same nonces? No, not just the nonces. Yeah. Um, in general, uh, I believe that the way it works in a pool is uh, you don't have everybody in the pool trying out the same nonces because that would be a waste of work and it would actually make the pool not really perform that much better than if they're you know doing it on their own, uh, in a pool, people will typically um, have like a set that they go through, or like an increment that they go through, so they won't overlap. And so everybody else is trying; they're not trying the same nonces, but they're still trying to solve the same problem, and it maximizes like the efficiency of trying to solve that one problem. 
Because if you had everybody going through the same nonces, then there'd be no actual benefit uh, in a pool. You'd basically be rate limited by whoever could go through the nonces fastest, and you'd just be going at their rate, if that makes sense. Yeah. What is the uh, current? Do you have like actual numbers of what's the uh, return on investment? Yeah, I think we actually do. For buying an ASIC or yeah. in general? Yeah, yeah. We'll be going over that. So some pros to having a pool is that it helps people participate. Like if you're just if you're a lone miner with one ASIC, you're not really going to be able to um, win the block that. Uh, Consistently, and you won't really want to connect yourself to the network because you'll be paying, paying a lot of electricity in the meantime. Um, also, uh, because you're running, um, you're using the software that's provided for you from the pool manager. Uh, you don't really need to worry about updates in the network, and we'll, worry, we'll talk about that later. Um, but some bad things about pools is that you're pretty much trusting this one pool manager um, and hoping that he doesn't run away with your money. And in addition to that, it makes the hashing power more concentrated. So before, in the CPU age, the hashing was more spread out, and there were less um, entities that controlled a high amount of hashing. So this actually happened in 2014. A mining pool by the name of ghash.io managed to accumulate more than 51% of all the hashing part of the network. Once that happens, it's pretty bad, because that one entity can pretty much decide what happens to the blockchain. Luckily, in that case, in 2014, the miners participating in the pool pulled out in fear that of all the processing power. So they they um, they pulled out of the pool and Ghash uh, lowered its its overall hash rate. Um, also, something to note is laundering hashes. Right here, we have a chart of all the uh, current um, mining pools and like how much uh, mining power they have in the system. But you really don't know which uh, from which entity each uh, hash power comes from. So if I'm a uh, a miner, and I own 50% of all the network's hash rate, I can split up my mining in multiple pools. I can put 20% in uh, via VTC, and then 30% in slush pool, and it'll be, it'll be split up, so no one can tell. And that's called laundering hashes. And now we'll be talking about um, the actual numbers behind mining. Uh, today, today's facts, so we know that Right now, the network hash rate is about 25 million terahashes per second. Also, let's assume that each um, Bitcoin costs $10,000. Not exactly, but we'll assume that. 10,000. Yeah, 10,000. And also, there's um, 657,000 Bitcoin every year for this year um, because it, the reward hasn't been halved. So knowing that, if you're a miner that owns one AMP miner S9, you have 40 terahashes per second. And uh, the probability of you winning a block is 0.0000005%. So very, very low. And your expected annual reward will be $3,600 a year. So that's not bad. But it doesn't account for the cost of actually buying that ant miner and also the cost of all the electricity and cooling that you're paying for. And the biggest problem with that is that you'll, uh, you'll win a block every 34.8 years. Yeah, so mathematically speaking. So on average, yeah, every 34.8 years, you'll get $125,000 as a reward, but it's hard to tell when it's gonna happen. And that doesn't come with any guarantee at all. But if you do mine with a pool, and that pool has a certain amount of uh, hash rate, you'll get like 42 cents per hour. So that's um, significantly better. Um, the paradox with that is that as a the uh, Bitcoin network becomes more secure and the hash rate increases, it's harder and harder for people to participate individually. So there's going to be more and more pools. And that's sort of a paradox because as it becomes more secure, there's more centralization, essentially. Secure meaning there's more hash rate because, uh, yeah, it'll be harder for someone else, external figure with hash rate to uh, infiltrate the system. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't mine for more than one pool at once because each block per pool is different, right? Because the coin base is different for every block. 
but um, depending depending on what rate each pool like offers, you can switch from pool to pool, and people do that. Uh, all right, if that's it, I'll be handing it to Noah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to finish this off with the future of mining or changing Bitcoin. So, all right, changing Bitcoin. So, uh, as you've noticed from the last section, one of the big features of Bitcoin right now, and actually a lot of cryptocurrency, is the centralization of mining. So, what can we do to decentralize mine, mining? And that actually brings up a lot of questions about how we mine. So the reason that mining is centralized right now is because the proof of work algorithm that we're using is uh, very easy to create ASICs for. Essentially, you can create specialized software, or excuse me, hardware, that gives you an advantage over the typical CPU or GPU. So that, in a way, requires a lot of capital, and that naturally leads to that centralization, because only people that are already established can start to buy these ASICs and participate in uh, the you know, hashing to, to solve this problem. So that naturally leads to the question, can we create an algorithm that is less susceptible to this ASIC centralization? And of course, that also brings up the question, what again do we need for a good cryptographic hash function? So if you look up there, there are a few refreshers on the puzzle requirements. So the first is it's quick to verify once you have a solution. That's basically when somebody publishes a nonce that works, everybody else can take a look at that with you know the block information that they posted and say, yeah, that solves the puzzle. Uh, second, you need adjustable difficulty. That's uh, the difficulty adjusting in the Bitcoin system every two weeks. Uh, third, you need computationally difficult puzzles because you don't want people to just be able to you know bring out answers really quickly like that. You want it to take some time so that you know that there's proof that they put some sort of resources into creating that solution, because that's kind of what, in a way, creates some value in the system. You know that people are incentivized to do this work. Uh, fourth, you need a rate or a solving rate that is proportional to compu computational power, which is uh, essentially um, you need a way that you you put in that work and then you know that like there will be solutions, essentially. Um, the fifth one is you need to have a progress-free system, which means that in uh, the, the puzzle that we're using, you can't, based on a previous hash, kind of, you know, get a warm answer and then get, you know, warmer, warmer, hotter towards the solution. Every different nonce you try will actually, you know, uh, be all over the place. Like, you won't get a, a similar hash even if you change the nonce by one. That's like the avalanche effect that we mentioned last week. And last, you need a pseudo-randomly generated uh, puzzle, essentially. So those are some of the characteristics for this cryptographic puzzle that we need to find. Um, what Bitcoin's puzzle is described as is a partial hash pre-image puzzle. That's basically you've got the beginning information plus one thing that you can vary, and you need to hash that information, you know, pick a value for that variable, hash that information, and then try and get something that is less than the difficulty. And that's the solution. So it doesn't uh, matter what follows. You just need to get that prerequisite number of zeros. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. So for decentralizing mining, that brings us to why did ASICs work? It's because you can easily create hardware that will uh, do that, that hashing extremely efficiently. And are there ways that we could potentially make an algorithm that is less easy for an ASIC to be built for. So that brings up the idea of memory hard and memory bound um, problems. So a memory hard problem is a problem that requires a lot of memory to solve. You can't solve it unless you've got that. Uh, versus a memory bound problem, it scales based on the memory that you have. So you can't get above a certain point unless you, know, you have a certain amount of memory. Uh, these two ideas, they're important, they're very similar. Just think about this idea as memory is a limiting factor. Memory hard puzzles, they deter ASICs as they exist now because ASICs are created to perform a certain function and just do that function. They don't actually have memory. They're just using processing power. 
to hash numbers, essentially. Uh, they're useless if there's optimization for memory because that's not actually part of that processing power. Memory is distinct. So memory, if memory is the limiting agent, the current ASICs used for Bitcoin wouldn't work. Moving on. Dogecoin and Litecoin are actually two cryptocurrencies that use... Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, can you not just build ASICs then Yeah. We'll get to that. That's actually a very prescient point. Let's, uh, I'll bring it back up later, okay? Um, were there any other questions before moving on? You had the same question, right? Okay, cool. Uh, if there's no other questions besides those, we'll get back to those. But So Dogecoin and Litecoin actually implement um, a memory hard hashing algorithm that's called sCrypt. Uh, it's the hash function that they use. They use the same partial um, hash pre-image puzzle. So it's the same as Bitcoin, except they just use a, a different hashing function that's actually bound by memory. And that means that uh, those ASICs that were built for Bitcoin don't work in either of these systems. The, the, the hashing function they were uh, using was actually created initially for hashing passwords and it makes it very hard to brute force. Whereas, if you think about it in Bitcoin, in a way you're essentially trying to brute force that answer. So it makes sense it's kind of difficult to uh, brute force this one in the same way. So, yeah, like I said, it's used by Dogecoin and Litecoin. So the way that it works, um, this is getting a little bit into the actual algorithm. It fills up a uh, buffer with interdependent data, and then it accesses uh, the data in a pseudo-random way. And if that's not like initially obvious as to why that requires a lot of memory, think about it like this. The more stuff that you can store in memory, the faster that you can look that stuff up. So say I have um, a list of things. If I can store that all in memory, I can look up anything in that list very quickly. So in this system, when you look up something at a a uh, specific point is actually inter interdependent on other data. So you have to look up other data too. If you can't store the entire thing in memory, then you actually have to compute different things on the fly. And that uses a lot of processing power. But if you had memory, it would be much faster. You wouldn't have to use that processing power. That's a very uh, technical explanation. So uh, are there any questions, clarification on how that works? The main idea is that it's memory bound. It requires a lot of memory to do quickly. And that limits it from ASICs that were used in the Bitcoin system. But an important thing to note is uh, it also has drawbacks. It requires an equal amount of memory to verify it quickly because you have to do the same thing. You basically have to confirm the answers. And then um, even though it was developed to be ASIC resistant, that's not the case. You can develop an ASIC with that memory, like was mentioned in a question. It's not like uh, you can just work around something and then the people that want to optimize will be like, oh shucks, like you figured out our one trick, we're never going to try anything again. They're going to continuously try and find the best way to do this so that they can you know, optimize for it and then be the quickest to hash. Another system is uh, what's used in Dash and it's called X11 or X13. And the way that that works is it's actually chaining together a bunch of different hash functions hash functions. And the idea here is that if you've got a bunch of different hash functions that are chained together, it's harder for an ASIC to deal with that because, you know, they're usually designed for just one. And if it's like switching around all the time, it might be difficult to optimize for. And uh, it periodically switches from SHA-1 to SHA-3 um, and then to S-Crypt for six months at a time. Um, it's easy to work around in a sense and it's not totally implemented yet, but even that considered, somebody has built an ASIC for it. So where there's this, uh, this profit that can be made, like Jason was saying earlier, the uh, key idea here is in game theory, everybody's motiv motivated by profit. If you, if you can create this technology that can be optimized for these puzzles, people are gonna do it. Even if there's not an easy way to do it yet, they're going to figure out a way because there's this enormous potential to make a lot of money uh, solving these puzzles. So there's really no such thing as an ASIC resistant algorithm. Even if you come up with a different thing to bound it on or you, know, you make it memory hard, things like that, there's going to be somebody that says, I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to build an ASIC and I'm going to make 
you know, I'm going to hash faster than anybody else. And I'm going to make a lot of money. And that's the idea here that it's basically a constant struggle to try and beat back the centralization because every, people are going to find ways to optimize for difficult puzzles, even if they are difficult to optimize for at first. Moving on. Uh, so this, this slide is talking a little bit about how we should consider um, ASIC resistance. And there's both pros and cons of ASICs and having ASICs in your system. So pros of ASIC resistance are uh, even though, uh, like, if you have a, a system that is ASIC resistant, um, ASICs typically they suppress the common user in the system. In fact, a really common mantra in the early Bitcoin space was one CPU, one vote. The idea was it should be almost like a democratic system that's decided by the users. It shouldn't be centralized by any entity. But the rise of ASICs actually kind of got rid of this because certain people had a, a much higher hash rate. They had a much higher capability of influencing the system and deciding the direction it went in. So ASIC resistance actually kind of brings back some of that democracy. And it decreases some of that centralization that we noted. But if you think about it on the other side of the coin, uh, the cons of ASIC resistance are, since ASICs are being designed only to solve this puzzle, they can't do anything else. That's a significant amount of capital that's sunk into a system. So, in, for instance, for Bitcoin, a lot of the hashing power comes from ASICs. In fact, most of the hashing power by like a very large majority comes from ASICs. So there's a lot of people with this specialized hardware out there that does nothing else besides mine Bitcoin. If Bitcoin were to suddenly tank, they would have a lot of useless hardware. So they don't want that. They want what's best for the health of the ecosystem. And so they're not going to try and do anything that will disrupt it. So for instance, when Jason mentioned that a hash pool, actually a mining pool was over 50% and they actually decided to disband because they didn't want to create fear in the system because they're all profiting off of it. And if they were to suddenly destroy the system or hamper it in some sense, they'd lose a lot of money and they'd have this technology that's really not good for anything else. And this idea of the, the hashing not really being useful for anything else, this uh, algorithmic uh, issue where like we're just doing a lot of work but we're not necessarily um, creating anything, that's also important to consider. Which brings me to the next point. This is extra, so it's not, you know, we're not going to test you on it, we're not going to quiz you on it. But the important idea here is that uh, people have tried to make hashing algorithms such that the work that the people that are mining are doing is useful. This is called proof of useful work. And it sounds like a great idea. Uh, it's basically, let's repurpose this, this computing power and let, let's make it solve real world issues, or at least you know problems that uh, people want to solve, like maybe a math problem, searching for large primes, or maybe searching for aliens, or simulating proteins at the atomic level, any of these different ideas, let's try and off-source this work, this computing power that's required onto people that are mining. It seems like a win-win, right? Well, there's issues with the idea of proof of useful work. And the issue is these uh, useful problems usually don't work as cryptographic functions. And there's a few reasons, and there's actually more reasons that are listed here, but a few of them are there's a uh, a fixed amount of data in these systems. So there's an exhaustible amount of solutions. So let's say we're trying to find uh, some, some mathematical solution to some problem that people have been working on and they're looking for a computational solution. As soon as somebody has found that solution, what do you do then? Your proof, proof of useful work is over. You've figured out a solution, it's not infinite, and does your blockchain just end? Like, what happens? That's one issue. There's not an inexhaustible supply of puzzles that can be solved. Whereas in Bitcoin, since the puzzle is based on the previous block and then also you know, your current uh, block's information, the header, it's inexhaustible. It can go on forever. You'll never run out of problems to solve. Further, um, potential solutions might not be uh, equally probable. So you could have uh, maybe like a proof of useful work that's looking for planets in the sky or something like that. It, there's no guarantee that you know it's equally hard to find a planet in different spots in the sky or something like that, or based on certain NASA imagery, it's equally hard to find planets because you know it's not. I mean, there's 
different variables. We can't really account for that. But the hash functions used in, say, Bitcoin, we know that it's, on average, equally difficult to find a solution. It's not like somebody is going to find a trick or anything like that. Uh, last, um, and perhaps I think the biggest issue, at least in my opinion, considering decentral decentralization, when you have these problems, you usually look to an authority to actually describe what the problem is and how you should go about solving it, which is missing the entire point. It's creating a centralized, decentralized currency because you have to have this one authority that tells you, okay, this is the problem. This is how you should go about solving it. These are correct solutions, yada, yada, yada. If they, say, collude with one of the groups that's working to solve it, then your system now has a point of failure that's been exploited. So that's something we want to avoid. So in summary, proof of useful work, even though it sounds like a great idea, it doesn't end up working out so well. Moving on, uh, another important factor in the Bitcoin ecosystem is consensus updates. And the idea behind a consensus update is since Bitcoin is decentralized, it's not like any one person can just say, hey, this is how things are going to go now, we're going to do this. Everybody kind of has to agree. You have to get consensus among everybody that's mining and, you know, in general, people that are using it to make an update go through. And the important thing to note, though, is even though it's decentralized in adoption, there is a centralized group that's working on it. There's a Bitcoin core development team, and there's actually uh, work from all over. So it's not just them. There's other people that will uh, work on different parts of upkeep for the Bitcoin software. Um, and the software is used for full nodes and mining, essentially. And it brings me to the two ways that uh, the blockchain protocols can be updated for Bitcoin. There's what are called hard forks and what are called soft forks. So the idea behind uh, the, the splitting difference between the two, rather, is that in a soft fork, you're doing something that you could do before, but you're limiting the space of what can be done. And whereas in a hard fork, you're doing something new and also doing things that can be done before. And the way that it was described to me, which made a lot of sense, so I'm going to draw it out, is in a soft fork, this is the old stuff you could do, and then this is the new stuff you can do. So you're basically limiting it in. You're making it more uh, focused in what you can do. Versus in a hard fork, this is the old stuff you can do, and then this is the new stuff you can do. And there's some overlap. I'm going to just label those, soft fork, hard fork. There's some overlap, but it's, you could be doing things that are totally new to the system. And so a soft fork doesn't require necessarily uh, an update to the protocol. It's just, excuse me, it, it can require an update to the protocol, but it's mostly how people are deciding to do things, whereas a hard fork will require actually new implemented features if that makes sense. Are there any questions on the two? Does the diagram make sense? Cool. All right, so uh, another important factor is what are called uh, Bitcoin improvement proposals. And this is the way that the community will basically vote on issues um, that they want to support or even propose them to other people in the community. And the idea is there's three types. There's uh, standard track VIPs, informational VIPs, and process VIPs. And so a standard track VIP is like an actual proposed update to the protocol. This is like, let's do something new or let's change how we do something in our current system. And it's really interesting because this is how the ecosystem changes. And people vote on this. And the way that they vote is, um, I believe, in the Coinbase transaction for miners, they will change an arbitrary digit to match the number of the Bitcoin improvement proposal that they're voting for. So they'll show, I'm supporting this because it's included in this arbitrary data that doesn't actually matter, but like, you know, I can change this to show support. So that's the idea behind them voting on it. Then an informational VIP is more so a discussion or like a guideline on how people should do things in the future, but it's not about changing the protocol, it's maybe about how certain things operate. So for instance, if you wanted to write an informational VIP about how maybe, like best practices for running a pool, that's kind of like the idea of what you'd do. And then the last one is a process VIP, which is more so specific things that you like, 
have to not have to do but like should be done like it's the again a best practice kind of thing but it's outside of the protocol as well um, and then yeah so the first BIP was proposed by Amir Taki and I believe that that BIP was actually a BIP to make BIPs so that's kind of meta it's pretty cool um, and yeah so how you signal support is you just include the reference number in the uh, block any questions on that stuff? Yes? So that means that on the mining we'll the Yes. Uh, if, you, if you don't win the race, then you can't really like publish thing, anything out. But it, there's the expectation that it's like a, a good sample. Though I guess with the fact that there are you know, pools of miners, it really does change. Are there any other questions? Yes. For hard forks and soft forks? So uh, it's when you want to add functionality. Um, I can't think of any examples offhand. Um, hard forks? Here, here. So uh, if you heard of Bitcoin Cash, like other offshoots of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, those are hard forks. Like they have a hard change in the protocol, and they're pretty much splitting off the main currency. But the thing is, the transaction history is still there before the fork. So that's why they say that if you own Bitcoin, at the time of the fork, Bitcoin Cash, you own Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, because they're separate blockchains. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All right. So here is your homework for the week. And that is it for the lecture. Wait, can I ask?